bring around that guilt and remorse and, and anxiety and, and how miserable that must be and how unwarranted it must be or, or that it is. So we, there are always cases for divorce. Uh, there are circumstances we can't address all of them. Things happen. I understand that. Th things do happen. However, I think that all of us could agree that many of the divorces that take place now could be prevented, are, are, are done for, no, for, for selfish reasons, not because that there was someone who was abusive or, or there was physical danger or, or things like that or, or, or adultery, but just because I, I'm tired of this person and I think I could do better. And to, to do that, to walk out on your family, especially when you have little kids, um, uh, it is, um, God really frowns on that. And the reason why he frowns on it is because it's so hurtful to all the parties involved. When God joins two people together, and as we just read, makes them one flesh, God looks upon that separation, not as two people simply going separate ways, but a tearing of a person in half and the bleeding and damage and injury that comes with all of that. So that's how God sees it. When he joins two people together and he joins the family together and these these two people come together and make little people in their own image and they are a core group and God wants to bless that and, and to and to participate in that and to and to nourish it and that to grow into something that's wonderful that can teach this family about God when that is torn in half that it's a grievous thing and we Got to, we've got to look at it from God's perspective. We've got to look at it from the perspective of, of the children and not just that, well, um, it's just something that people do. It's something that half of people do and, and it's not, not a big deal. It is a, it is a big deal. And the people who are saying that it's not a big deal are saying it to smooth their own consciences by and large. All I'm saying and all God is saying here in the Bible, I don't mean to be irreverent. I'm not speaking for God, but... but if at all possible, don't do it. You know, don't 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 just have that as as a parachute to get out when you start feeling uncomfortable. Because, well, let's let's move on. Keep the family circle closed and tight, closed tightly. This is very important and something that I see broken all the time, and it's so damaging. The Bible says, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." The Bible says, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She will do him good, not evil, all the days of her life. And the Bible says, the Lord hath been witness between thee and thy wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. And the Bible says, keep thee from the evil woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? So he that goes into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. So what God is telling us is, is the short-sighted or the ignorant man would say, oh, God just doesn't want us to have any fun. All these rules, rules, rules in the Bible. Take away your rules. I don't want any of these. What are these rules? What's God telling us here? God's telling us to go is to, to not break the covenant of marriage. To not break the trust of husbands and fathers. Don't go out and, and, and cause and, and get involved with another woman. Because it destroys the relationship that you have with your wife or husband. And it destroys the relationship that has with the other woman. If, if she happens to be married. Or the other man if he happens to be married. And look, what, look at the wreckage. Two families and the children. I mean it's, it's, a, it's, it's terrible. That one thing. And for what? And for what? what? What was it that was so willing to destroy all of these lives? So when God is giving us this, these commandments and these instructions, he's not doing it because he doesn't want us to have a good time. A, a, a child says something like that. A man child, a woman child. But a thinking adult, how can you not agree with God? Is that, does that not make sense to you? Does not the rational mind understand how destructive this is? Not to mention the jealousy and, and the danger you could bring upon yourself from a jealous husband showing up at your door with a loaded revolver. You know, when we have many instances of that. Number 10. God describes love. Make it your daily goal to measure up. Well, the Bible says love is forbearing and kind. Love knows no jealousy. Love does not brag. It's not conceited. She is not un unmannerly, nor selfish, nor irritable, nor mindful of wrongs. 
She does not rejoice in injustice, but joyfully sides with the truth. She can overlook faults. She is full of trust, full of hope, and full of endurance. So right there, I mean, that, that the thing speaks for itself. What true love is, it knows no jealousy. You find yourself a jealous person, you're not exhibiting true love. You find yourself that you remember and uh, faults or wrongs that your husband had did to you or slights and, and you bring those around and, and beat him over the head with them. When you're doing that, you're not, you're not acting in love. You're not acting in your best interests. Do you think the nagging woman, her nagging and her bringing your husband's faults or his past indiscretions back around and around and around is going to cause him to love you more? No, it's going to do just the opposite. And the same goes for men. Number 11, remember that criticizing and nagging destroys life. For all of the, I think maybe women have gotten an unfair rap about being a little bit more on the nagging side of their husbands, that uh, the nagging side than husbands do. And that may or may not be true. But I, I it seems to me that the being critical is uh, the husband's prerogative. I know that that is my main, main fault, that I look at my wife and sometimes if I'm not really careful, instead of seeing all of the wonderful things she's doing for me or the, the hour that she spent slaving in the kitchen making me a nice meal and, it, and she sits it down in front of me and it's not to my particular liking or taste at that moment, that I can easily fall into criticism, completely losing sight of the fact that she just set aside her day to make this for me and made it out of love and and um, and showed me by doing it. And here I am, now I'm going to say that this isn't right or, or you didn't do this right or be critical. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's so destructive. And that again is our default position, what we seem to go back to. So when we, as we talked about earlier, guarding our heart with all diligence, thinking and going to God before we act and before we speak. And it's a clunky process at first when you're not used to doing it, to have to stop what you're doing when you realize that you're going down the wrong path or you're about to do something that's that's dangerous or um uh, i'm sorry i got my sidetrack there if they i'll have to move on lost my train of thought uh number 12 do not overdo anything uh, do not overdo in anything but be temperate the bible says every man that striveth for the mass for mastery is temperate in all things the Bible says, love does not pursue selfish advantage. And the Bible says, whatsoever therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So this is very important. So what it's saying, what do you think of when you hear the word temperance? Temperance is kind of a, a Victorian word. When we think of temperance, we think of teetotalism and, and um, a, 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 a stout conservative Puritan um, trying to prevent anyone from having fun. I mean, does that not what comes, what's what comes to mind for me? But what, that's not from the Bible. What, what God's telling us is what, be temperate in your things. Yes, it's okay to go out and to go golfing with your buddies. It's not okay to be selfish and every day that you have off, leave your wife at home with the kids while you're out golfing. Or it, same thing, I, I, don't, I don't mean to just single out men or single out women. I'm just giving analogies. Women, it's not okay for you to sit and to read novels all day and, ne and neglect and ignore your husband or, or to whatever it is. The devil will, will, will use things that can be good things like working in the garden, spending time with friends, even the ministry. I've seen so many people that what they're doing looks good and, and they're spending all their time ministering to other people and they're sitting and going to houses and visiting the sick and doing all these things while their, their, their family, their young wife and their children sit at, home with, sit at home abandoned by their father. So just because something's good to do, it doesn't mean it's good to do all the time. So we have to really be conscious of that and, and to remember that 50-50 rule. Make sure that 50% of the time you're doing something for yourself, make sure you do the other, uh, other for, for someone else, for your loved ones. Make, just, just be aware of it and to think about it and, just, and, and then you're not likely to fall into it. Number 13, respect each other's personal rights and privileges. 
Uh, this is something that Mrs. Wrangler Star has always been very good at. Uh, she has access to my email. She has access. She has my keys. I, I, we don't have any secrets between us. Um, my, but she always asked before she would to take anything out of my wallet. She asked permission. She always asks, even though she has the password, before she logs into my email, she asks permission. And I tell her all the time, you, know, you don't need to ask me for this. If you need to go in there and find something, just, just go get it. And she says, no, you know, I, it's, these are your things and I respect them. And, and I think that's wonderful. And not because we have anything to hide, but I, I, I would do the same thing, that we just respect each other that way. And it, it, that's what it does. It shows admiration and respect. Respect, and I think it's a good practice. Number 14, be clean, modest, orderly, and dutiful. The Bible says in like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And the Bible says she works with willing hands. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. And the Bible says, be ye clean. And the Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. One thing I don't understand, I was, uh, I just noticed this on a video I watched the other day. A lot of um, homesteader channels, a lot of people professing to be Christians or people of faith, and I'm not going to name names, but this particular person, uh, a woman that does videos, um, very professed Christian and, and, and definitely shows the values with homesteading and homeschooling and all that, is doing a video and with a shirt cut down to here and, and bending over the camera and everything is exposed. And I, I thought, um, why does she do that? What, what's, the, what's the purpose? What's the point of that? She's married. It's not that she's uh, doing that to try to attra attract a potential mate. But she has a husband at home. She's got children at home. The children are often in the videos. And there she's wearing these clothing that are inappropriate like that. What, what is the motivation? I, I, I don't understand that. If you are married and you have, uh, as a wife, you have, have a husband at home and, and a family, why would you go out in public dressed provocatively? Because there's one reason to do that, and that's to draw attention to yourself. And it works. We all know it works. So what, why... What I'm saying, what the Bible's saying here is, is, is don't do that. Don't do that. There's a time and a place for those things. Yes, I, it is in a woman's nature and it is in a woman's honor to be beautiful and, and, and to be attractive and be, to, to be a, a desirable. But that needs to happen inside the confines of the marriage. That's a private thing. And there are men that, that uh, get off on having their wives dress up like sluts and parading them around a town. Um, and I don't, I don't get that either. I, I, you see them all the time and they, they just love and enjoy that feedback or that ego boost of all these other men ogling and staring lustfully at their wives. Is that what a grown man does? I don't think so. Would you like that? Cause I wouldn't. So it goes both ways. Uh, one thing that Mrs. Wrangler star and does that I really admire and respect for, she always is very modest with her apparel. She, she's, um, yeah, I'm not, you don't have to dress up in a prairie dress and wear a bonnet. Some people will, can take that, will take that to an extreme. And, and I wouldn't fault anyone for doing that either, providing they're not making their clothing an idol, which can be. Some people can take that to such an extreme where they wear these things or these prairie dresses from the turn of the century. And they think that they're more holy than the rest of us because they do that. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that's the right mindset. But if you have a conviction that God has laid it upon your heart as a woman to wear skirts or dresses, to wear conservative clothing, and, and, and you want to do that and you want to honor God, I think that that's wonderful. So don't project your feelings or, or, or of how things should be onto other people when it comes to that. I want to, I want to stress that. But when it comes to the cleavage and the push-up and, and, and the shorts and the mini skirts and all those things for married women, I think it's inappropriate and uh, damaging and dangerous to the marriage. There, was I clear on that? Just my opinion. Number 15, determine to speak softly and kindly to one another. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And we all know that. An argument can be 
if we if our wife comes to us and we know we're in the wrong, oftentimes we want to hide our fault by blustering and making a big noise, right? We've all done that before and try to turn it around and put the fault back on her. It goes both ways. So that escalates and we all know where that goes. It, it goes into hard feelings, hurt feelings, and, and it damages and it, it, and it is another cut, a bleeding wound on that marriage. But what the Bible's telling us is here that, is that a soft answer turns away wrath. So if we are humble and our wife comes to us and, and she has a grievance and we are guilty of it, stop and admit it. And, and take steps to, to make a correction. And then, the, and then the, argument, the argument never takes place. She may have been very angry when she came to you and had to pick up your clothes all over the floor for the 50,000th time. And you could say, well, you know, I go out and, and I work hard too, and that's your job and you should just do it. And then, and then what's going to happen? We're going to have a huge fight and the marriage and the family's damaged. But if the man says, uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Um, I will make a better effort to do that and to follow through and do it. There is no converse. There is no conflict. There is no argument. And what you have built in your wife's eyes and in her mind is love, respect, and admiration instead of fear, anger, and anxiety. So, I mean, do we soil our own beds? Do you want to you want to soil your own bed and roll around in it and sleep in it? Because when you react that way to each other, when you answer that way and you argue and you fight, and I'm not even talking about what it does to the children when you do it in front of them, you're soiling your own bed. You've got to live in that marriage. You've got to live with that woman, with that husband. Don't you want it to be peaceful and happy? Don't you want to have mutual respect and love and admiration for one another? Don't engage in arguments. 16, be reasonable in money manners. Bible says it love, it love is not possessive. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Money is the, I think I've read many people say that money is the greatest cause of divorce. The money, the stress that money brings. So what God is telling us, and there's, there's a lot more, a lot more in the scriptures about it than this, is that be, be careful with our money. One thing, uh, we had a neighbor that had been married for 60 years. And uh, we would talk to him and, and uh, ask him one time, you know, what was the secret of, of those two being so successful? And he said, you know, one thing that was really important in our marriage is that we never spent, if, it w if we were ever going to spend over $100, and that this rule was probably done in the 50s, so the $100 today is not what it used to be. But you can choose a number, let's say a 500 or a 1,000. We would talk it over and we both would agree on it. So if I wanted to go buy something, if I wanted to buy a new welder, I didn't just... Um, buy it and then show up and unload it in the car and uh and say uh surprise i bought a new three thousand dollar welder or wives did you go do need to go buy five hundred dollars worth of shoes and hide them in your closet and not talk to your husband about it it, it goes both ways i'm not saying that, that you need to do that to get permission I, i'm not that's not the case at all a, a, a healthy happy marriage you don't seek permission from a wife. You don't seek permission from a husband. But you're one flesh. You're one person. You need to be on the same page. And it shows respect. Just like it shows respect of asking your wife before you go digging through a purse looking for the keys. It shows respect that before you make a, a purchase, even if it's something that doesn't really pertain to her, that she doesn't really have any knowledge about, talk to her about it. Tell her why you want to do this. Tell her why that this is important for the family. And, and it just shows respect. And it again, doing those things will build your wife's love and admiration, respect and joy for you and trust in you by doing that versus sneaking off and buying something and trying to hide it from her. Because again, what are you doing? You're soiling your own bed. Number 17, talk things over and counsel together freely kind of goes back to, to what we just talked. One thing that I have really benefited from Mrs. Rangastar is getting a different perspective. Um, I will, um, I, I, I'm a person that makes up my mind very quickly. I um, weigh the facts, I make the decision and I act on it. But she is more of a thinker. She 
uh, will do a lot of research. She will look at things from multiple angles. A lot of that is, is due to her, her training at, um, as a, a lawyer because they teach you how to think asymmetrically, you know, looking at things from different perspectives. But part of it is also her way. It's just her way. She's very analytical and she's very smart that way. And so I can have... I have benefited from, I've made terrible mistakes by just going in, not having all the facts, making big purchases or making decisions and not uh, knowing all the details where if I take down and we sit down and, and discuss it and sleep on it, then I'm much better armed, to, uh, much better prepared to make a decision that I won't regret. Time and time, it, it, it uh, she has proven me right. So yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm.